Everybody, welcome to another installment of Show to V with Mike G, the show about life, whiskey blending, artistness, literature, and so much more. Today's kind of a special episode. I love the folks down at Compass Box, and whenever you put Calvados and blend it with a single malt scotch whiskey to have a bottling, you're bloody brilliant for doing so. So I always admire the work over there. So they just did a re-release on the Artist Blend and the Glasgow Blend, and they are actually new and improved. And today we sit down with assistant whiskey maker James Saxon to talk about the process, talk about the art, talk about literature, and so much more. So I hope you guys enjoy this great chat with James Saxon of Compass Box. You know, you, you got me thinking about artists all the time with these two new blends. And and I know they've been around, but they look spruced up. They're, they're beautiful, a little bit of kitschy, excuse me, cheeky humor on the Glasgow blend. But so the thing that I was curious about, you know, you got a master's in British literature. So did you ever fancy yourself an artist, someone that created a writer, perhaps? I did not think this chat was going to start off with my, my hopes and dreams there. Mike. <laughs> uh, yeah, as, as a young kid, you know, you, you have the, the past mapped out, maybe a little bit in local news. And then, you know, by the time you're, I wouldn't be too ambitious, 22, 23, you know, you're a best-selling author. Um, but that's, uh, <laughs> that, that dream's on hold for now. Uh, yeah, the, the one thing I love, really love about working with Compass Box is... The whiskey is our central focus. Of course it is. We need to make sure that what's going into a bottle is as good as it possibly could be and sure. if possible, better. But we always like to play with ideas and we always like to take inspiration from many, many different places. So I do not have a, a chemical background, uh, which I think a lot of people assume you need if you're going to be going into blending. Right. Um, but you're right. I spent four years reading a lot of books, um, coming across a lot of theories, coming across a lot of movements in art and uh, and culture and uh, that pays dividends when you're when you're coming up with a brief for a new product um how it's going to look story we're trying to tell right so well, there's something say, it, it's so actually to to double down on that point loving art in a sense gives you a perspective doesn't it 100 percent. yeah yeah and, and for you when you just still kind of diving into the literature piece what in your past or even currently writers, what, what kinds of writers really stimulated you, maybe drove you to inspiration and you would consider maybe even an influence? Oh yeah, for sure. There's so many. I actually did my undergraduate dissertation um, on William Makepeace Thackeray's Vanity Fair. Okay. Specifically all of the drink references in it, of which there are many. Uh, so that was an entire semester of me combing through the text and then finding all sorts of other articles and, and creative pieces that were written around about the same time, basically to try and unpick a character drinks X. What does that say about them? Because there was all, all sorts of connotations then as now about what you drink says something about you. So I was trying to unpick that in the context of um, upper class Victorian um, society. So that that's was really kind cool. of it was incredibly intriguing at that time, right? As a younger man, which we both were some years ago, what were you drinking then? Cause it took me a little while to purposely learn about scotch. But it, yeah, it's one of those categories that you, you sort of find yourself into somehow, but I, I started, um, relatively early, I suppose. So I'd already, um, really gotten the bug by the time I, I got into university. Um, in fact, I took a year between high school and, and going to college to um, get on a bike and cycle to lots of Scotch whiskey distilleries. Okay. Um, so that was, that was a six, six week marathon um, getting all around the country and, and seeing the, the ways whiskey's made uh, in different parts of the country. So that was brilliant. Uh, and then, yeah, um, really 
studying was just um, that bit on the side while I ran whiskey clubs and, uh, <laughs> and kept my blog updated and all that sort of stuff. When you, the first foray, because you didn't learn how to blend necessarily at Compass Box. That was your force de triumph, right? That's the, the, the crowning achievement, at least thus far. But if I understand correctly, you were working for Shiva's doing blends. And were you actually an ambassador in Dubai? Did I read that correctly? That's correct. Yeah, you've, you've incredible homework there. Um, but yeah, I started off my career in the industry uh, representing um, Shiva's Brothers' blended scotch portfolio in the Middle East. So yeah, I was, I was living in Dubai, but doing lots of work elsewhere. Um, so not really any blending at, at that stage, but it was a two-year course, if you like, a two-year program um, in the Middle East. And then they asked me, what do you want to do? And my first love has always been um, how this, this great liquid comes into being. And um, blending is a process that is always, always fascinating. And I thought I am in such a such a unique position here to see how, you know, Shivers Brothers, second largest Scotch whiskey business in in the world, how do they do things? So um, I was I was in the sample room, um, overseeing um, various different operations. Um, so I didn't have the title of blender, but you you start to pick up a few things, and mm. you know, every so often there's a was a pilot blend that they would get me to do. And, and that kept my, um, I guess it, it kept all of the, the, the principles of, of blending in mind and, and understand how a recipe comes together and looking at your stocks and, and what can you do now and in 10 and 15 and 20 years time. It was a, a brilliant way to begin. But with compass boxes, when I really started to you know, get the measuring cylinders out and the pets and, uh, and come up with some of, some of my own blends. So that's, yeah. That's been so exciting. In fact, when I joined in 2019, one of the very first projects I worked on was a slight tweak to the formula for Artist Blend. How can we make this even more delicious mm -hmm. and still stay true to that fruity, um, ethereal sweetness um, that Artist Blend has been known for? Because as you say, these both these whiskies have been around, um, in the case of Artist Blend, 10 years now. Um, Glasgow Blend is, is a slightly newer sibling. Um, but we always have to evolve, we have to keep moving forward, um, being an independent blending house without our own distilleries. Um, we need to be constantly playing with stocks mm -hmm. as an ongoing challenge. I liken it to wrestling a playful grizzly. Uh, every <laughs> a year. playful one, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, usually playful. Um, but we're always having to juggle stocks and, and tweak that recipe and um, this is why, you know, we're, we're so transparent with what we do and anyone who's, who's tried these before and has bottles on their shelf in their home bar, you know, if you ever want to know what's in this particular batch, well, usually somewhere towards the bottom, there will be a, um, a little laser etched code. And if you come at us with that, we can tell you exactly what is in that bottle. Would, you know, if we... You know, in the States, we love transparency. So it's something I quite enjoy about Compass Box and also becomes a little bit like a, a riddle too. You know, you say, I kind of think I taste this thing. And if you drink enough scotches and then you've even, you know, you've worked with Calvados before, which is another thing where it's like, oh, I think I can taste that, which is I think Affinity, one of my favorite bottlings of all time. But so one thing that I ask of all the blenders and the distillers that I, I interview, we get in our heads, there's always some way, I don't know if it's called synesthesia or not. I think that's the word for it, but we taste things and maybe we see a color or we taste things and we maybe see a shape. But for you, when you are crafting a whiskey, a blend specifically, what is the texture that runs through your mind? Is it a visual one? Do you imagine textures as in like textiles, things of that nature? So I'm I'm not synesthetic. I'd be interested. To, it sounds like you are. You are. You have a, a little little hint of that. If there's, a, the, there's a hint of something in here, John. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I like anyone. You know, if you if you smell something at the right time and in the right way, um, you know, you can get that crystal clear memory of something unconnected to whiskey. Usually, mm. right? um, something in your past. So that happens every now and again. But I I have to take a a different stance on it and, and I know so many samples on a, on a, on a weekly basis that um, I am kind of zeroed in on, on just the flavour. There are times, don't get me wrong, when we're looking at new parcels and there'll be, there'll be a row of glasses in front of me and as you go through them, we usually sample maybe five, five casks from a parcel that we, we might have available to us. 
and we get into those and there might actually be a, a temperature for me. So some, some whiskies are cooler than others, mm. um, even from the same distillery, even from the same cast type, the same parcel. Um, and there's, there's the kind of warmth that I look for in whiskey. And, and we, we tasted, John and I, we tasted something today, which, yeah, just had that. Um, it was a blend of, of malt whiskies and everything just came together. And there was a, there was a temperature that was a certain color. It was, there was that slight, you know, ripe apricot skin, that mm -hmm. beautiful soft pinky orange. Um, not too far away from actually Glasgow blend. <laughs> um, that is, that's as close as I get. Um, Tell me, because I love this, this temperature, because I actually equate temperature to, to a color to normally, and music is my main compass of which mm. I, I craft stuff and distill, but what, all right, because if I was to interpret you the way that you kind of talk about cool, hot or warm, cold. So I'm sipping some of the artist blend, right? And to me, the kind of crispness and the light fruitiness and this beautiful note, note of rice as a descriptor, I think that's bloody brilliant. But is this something you might deem as cool or cooling? It's funny you should mention that because I, I always associate this with a summer, as a summer. Wow. This, this has a, a quintessential summer's afternoon, have it neat, ice cube, highball. We love the highball in, in compass box. But it's interesting for me, now that we're drilling down into it, Artist Blend always has like a, a pale duck egg blue color to me. Interesting. So as you've got the warmer days and I'm looking out my window here in London and we've not been having them this spring so far. I'm sure they're on the horizon. Yeah. Uh, but I do, I, I, I temper that warmth, that, that humidity with this clean, clear blue. Uh, and that's kind of what Artist Blend I want that. Absolutely. It, there's a clarity there. And it's whether or not when you drink it is different than how it makes you feel. Mm. And for me, it is very crisp and cooling. I, I would say subdued, like a calm, tranquil personality, right? And so going into this, this latest, because the, 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 the new design is, is beautiful. Did you have any objectives when working on this blend again? Did you say, here's some things potentially we could work on in the profile of the artist blend? So the, the project we gave ourselves was basically we wanted it to be as good as the, the artist blend that we already had, but we still wanted it to be you know, demonstra demonstrably superior and I guess just more concentrated. Um, so that was a tough brief um, coming in and, I was still getting familiar with the stocks that we had available. Uh, lots of sampling. Um, we used many, many different um, different distilleries. But we hit upon this combination of Kleinlish that we'd filled ourselves. And Kleinlish has is, is always uh, uh, been a, a, stay, uh, a mainstay for Compass Box. But we had the Kleinlish, we had Linkwood, which is such a beautiful oh, floral, yeah. fruit, fragrant whiskey. Um, but we also had this parcel from Balmenich. Balmanic is a very lesser known distillery. It's from Speyside, um, really old style. Um, you're, you're clearly a, a, an arts and culture man. So I'd recommend picking up a Scotch, um, Scotch whiskey in fact and stories by uh, Robert Bruce Lockhart. Um, his grandfather um, started up Balmanic. Oh, wow. So it's from the very beginning of the 19th century. Worm tubs, very sort of stripped back. Um, as I say, a lesser seen single malt because it's just so good in blends. And I think that is what's delivering this custard apple, um, demerara sugar, real intensity. Um, and so that wasn't a parcel that had been used in artist blend at any point in the past. Um, but just to just check in my notes, 10% in the recipe for, for that with the Balmenic. Wow. Just to overdrive some of that fruitiness and give a great texture. Texture, that's what blended scotch is all about. And what, it, you know, proof to me, can, it, it can be everything. It can be the key to a brilliant whiskey or something that's just mediocre. And at 43 here, which, you know, is roughly below the chill filter point. I know you guys do that. But it is so vivid still. Did you... Mm -hmm. How did you arrive at 43 being the right proof? Because actually a lot of the bo bottlings, if I recall, hedonism, for instance, original is like 43% too, which just seems to be a <laughs> sweet spot. But for here in the artist blend, why is this the sweet spot, you think? 
It's a really good question. I know John has always had both of these whiskies at 43. So um, I was actually in the Whiskey Society in St. Andrews when John visited, having launched, created what was then Great King Street Artist Blend. Um, and he basically served it to us first in a highball. Um, I vividly remember it. He had, he described it, it was the Artist Blend, there was some orange bitters, and there was a little bit of cognac. And then he built that in the glass with the ice and the, the soda water. And I think the 43, it gives you that clinging quality when you mix it, when you lengthen it, but it also helps just to drive those flavors forward when you are drinking it neat. And I drink most of my whiskey neat. Um, when I'm in the mood for a cocktail, I'll go in for that. But I find, and it's the same with, so interestingly, when you look at our malts, um, Oak Cross, as, as was, and Story of the Spaniard, they're both at 43. We've tried them at 46, and they, they do show themselves well, but we feel as whiskey makers, you say proof is so important, and it, and it really has a bearing on the way it performs straight out of the bottle. And so proof for us, that's the test. If we can pour it straight from the bottle and it's still vivid, as you say, and it's still relaxing and soothing, we know we've kind of hit upon the right, the right strength, the right balance. And I think 43 does that as, as a strength for these whiskies. There are other whiskies we release where we need that extra ABV for whatever reason. Um, but with Artis Blend and Glasgow Blend, 43 just seems to pack the concentration while still being incredibly well mapped. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I haven't pulled off a sweater in some time because I live in Texas, right? So, but I've, I would, I would gear outfit right now just absolutely perfectly pinned up, right? And that's kind of how I consider this whiskey as well. It just, everything is so perfectly balanced in it. And so, and all right, so we have kind of like an East meets West thing. Now, not truly, but you have the artist blend, which is basically based uh, on the town Edinburgh, right? And then you have the Glasgow blend, which I would imagine is about the city Glasgow. So kind of give me... <laughs> <laughs> now, geography is not a strong suit for me, but, you know, the art stuff. But tell me how these two coexist. Like Gemini is a twin, right? And there's a duality there. And I sense and suspect some duality to the personalities of these two, as well as the flavors, which are totally different, but yet super complementary. Was that an intentional thing to have this two sides? Two Yes, it 100% was. So John read um, uh, another whiskey book, um, Whiskey, by Aeneas MacDonald. And in that, MacDonald talks about the different preferences throughout the UK. Um, so he, there is, there is a, a certain type that's favoured in London, and then there's, it goes gradually up the, up the country. And, uh, and he gets to Edinburgh, and he said, Edinburgh, they like a full-bodied whiskey. Glasgow, even more so. And I think this is, I think this is a really important point to make which is nowhere in the world how terrible would it be if everyone in the world drank the same thing oh yeah, yeah. as is true within a country as it is um, you know for a continent or even the world mm. so for us there was no way a single blended scotch whiskey could capture the different sides of both whiskey making in scotland and the culture of whiskey enjoyment and consumption in scotland and so this is why we've created this this two-part series, um, this little mini range. So on the east side, as you say, you've got Edinburgh, and they like to think of themselves in one way. And then on the west, you've got Glasgow. And as always, when you've got two rivals, um, they start to classify, classify themselves in opposition to one another. Sure, James, because this is intensely interesting to me, because how I would understand it might not be as drastic. We got West Coast folks. California, and we got our East Coast. Super laid back, super chill. That's right. And New York, a little faster pace, a little more <laughs> abrupt. Tell me culturally the difference between Edinburghians, or I think that there's another word for that, and people from Glasgow. What's that main kind of makeup, that personality difference? I think there is the contrast is. A fascinating one and I was lucky enough to live in Glasgow for, for nearly four years and going to university in, in St Andrews you're not far from Edinburgh so I spent a lot of time there too and my mum grew up in Edinburgh and they have a lot more that unites them than they maybe want to admit but um, <laughs> classically Edinburgh 
um, really goes in for um, you know the the artistic scene being the capital. You know, they want to to push everything mm-hmm. to I think a more international audience. The way the way it sometimes comes across, Edinburgh likes to um, you know to to go for. Um, whether it's you know the Michelin stars with its restaurants, or the Glasgow um, recently got one with Kale Brook, uh, um, or whether it's you know the, the festival itself, the biggest art festival in the world. I think capital cities is the same with London. You know they they like to they like to be international, and Glasgow just has such such a wonderful richness within itself. I think if you talk to any Glaswegian, it's like they're they're thrilled when when people come and visit them because normally everyone's just you know crowding on the Royal Mile and taking photos of Edinburgh Castle, mm-hmm. um, but there is so much to see and, and, and do in Glasgow too. But I think yeah, Glasgow with its with its shipbuilding past, with its mills, with all of this you know proud industry and and architecture, um, I think there's an extra grit to Glasgow. Also, the weather's worse. So <laughs> <laughs> that maybe engenders that too. Uh, very moist. But you know, you, you know it'll get, if you're in a place with bad weather long enough, it will in fact have its impacts on your personality, I think. I think it will. But no, the Glaswegians, so much warmth, so much, um, so much humor. Uh-huh. And um, yeah, Edinburgh, um, they have their warmth too. But I think a bit like the New Yorkers, there's a bit more, a bit more pace to things. Um, so it's, it's just a fascinating one, and I'm still very early in, in, in my understanding of these two great cities. I'm still exploring myself, but I think one thing that's worth noting here, which even if I held the bottle up, you can't see it, but I'd had the, there's a guy who reps, represents a nice scotch company here, lives in Austin, Texas, and he's always taking the piss out of me. You know what I mean? Like he's a, all, always, and he's from Glasgow, and I'm not real surprised. But one of the <laughs> things, and well, let's talk about the Glasgow band because it is a little more playful, a little less pinned up. It, it's still refined in the same sense that it's a nice blend, but it tastes a little more punk rock to me, mm-hmm. which is, is, yeah. is something I really enjoy. But, you know, the thing I find the best on this bottle is if you pay enough attention, there's a dunce construction cone on the Dukes. I don't know, actually, who, who, who is this a statue of? So it's a statue of the Duke of Wellington. There we go. Okay. <laughs> it, uh, it sits outside Glasgow's uh, Gallery of Modern Art. And I guess sometime, someday, this, you know, quite buttoned up, as you say, statue just didn't really, really fit in the, the view of a particular Glaswegian. Right. And, um, Fair play to him. He must have been on the gymnastics team because getting up there to put a traffic cone on that statue, it's a long way up. It's <laughs> a long way up. Uh, so brave as well as uh, a sense of humor. And limber, uh, right? Now, um, the, the Duke of Wellington statue is always dressed down with a traffic cone. Um, is it, so that's a permanent piece now? It's a permanent piece, yeah. It became a piece of artwork itself, right? Precisely. It's this... Um, I don't know what you'd call it. It's it's like it's like those pieces of art where um, you know the the rebellion, the statement is the art, and um, yeah, you're kind never of, without yeah. you're never without a traffic cone on the statue. Sometimes there's one on the horse as well, <laughs> <laughs> and, and every so often there's the rare triple cone. Um, but uh, where does yeah, the tri- where does the third one go? This seems uh, logistically uh, that's that's on the back of the horse. I yeah. see. Okay. <laughs> well, all right. If you find a place to put a cone, I suppose they'll find a place to put a cone. Exactly. Exactly. So tell me the, the, the philosophy here, which of course you, you're describing the cultural and the kind of personality differences between the two cities. But the nose is different. This has a slight peat to it. I think some from Lefroy, but that's you know that might be the case, might not. But it's really really delicious and more assertive so do you get into you know if someone gave you a script to write a, a rom-com you got one mindset right you're right notting hill you're like hugh grant has to be in it right or if you're thinking now i need to write kind of an edgy flick like jim jarmusch you want to do steady cam in new york or something right is that mindset when you come to blend this completely different than it is for blending the artist blend it is you know it's you've got choices when 
when we're caught between two recipes sometimes, different balances of the different ingredients, you've got a call to make. And, and that's, that's what we do as whiskey makers. And for Artist Blend, if we're not quite sure on a recipe, it's like, well, which is the most integrated? Which is the most, most harmonious? Mm-hmm. And then in Glasgow, it's like, okay, this is a little bit burlier, a little bit heavier. That's probably the one we should go for. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is leaning on your taste buds a little bit more. Um, which, is, which is really impressing its character upon you. Um, and if in a 50-50 call, always go for the bolder one. Boldness is, is the character of Glasgow and it's at the heart of Glasgow blend. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, I don't know my Hollywood actors well enough to really know, but, um, you know, I, I think whoever plays that boldness well, whoever's just a tiny bit over the top, just on the edge, um, that's what we're looking for with Glasgow. I love it. Yeah, it makes a whole lot of sense. Care to share a few of the blending components here, given this is, again, very different and a little, bold's a good word for it. It's a little more rich, too, than the artist blend. What are some of the yeah. parcels involved here? So both of these whiskeys are inspired by um, recipes from what we call the golden age of blending, end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th. And back then, if you look at ledgers, and John has these uh, squirreled into the archives the proportion of malt whiskey to grain whiskey was a lot higher than the standard now and so we put 55 percent malt whiskey into artist blend 65 percent or thereabouts again it changes slightly back to back um, with glasgow so 35 percent is the, the grain whiskey from cameron bridge but most of the flavor is being generated by a highland single malt which has been aged or finished in oloroso sherry casks that is about i want to That's about 32 to 35%. Again, it varies. Mm-hmm. It's about, but if we look for a third of that whiskey to be sherry casks. And then about 18 to 20% is whiskey from, as you said, uh, that famous Isla distillery. Um, so on our paperwork, it says Williamson. But uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sure you and your, your viewers uh, will be able to crack that code. It, it's hard to say. You know, I, I don't know much about things, but it's possible we're both right. Uh, Williamson, that sounds good to me. Um, and so that that peat and sherry one-two punch um, we don't want it to be too smoky we still want a little bit of refinement and I think what's beautiful about blended scotches in general if if the single malts like to speak about the countryside and the glens and mountains and the lakes or the rocks um, I feel blended scotch can really speak to the cities and that's another Mm -hmm. reason why we've got Edinburgh and Glasgow represented Mm -hmm. here and there's this sort of urbane confidence you know, a little bit industrial, a little bit of that, you know, um, train tracks and oil and diesel and all that sort of industrial stuff, yeah. which is much at the heart of, you know, Glasgow was the second city of the empire. Most of the ships that were sailing around the world at one point, um, a lot of them would have been uh, made in Glasgow. So that coal dust soot oil that you get from the, from the Williamson, it's just totally fitting in this blend. Um, but yeah, that is why we've got two. You couldn't hope to balance these two together. They need, they need to tell their own story. And, and it does. It's a very, very complete narrative. And, and if you drink the Glasgow blend second, you get a hell of a twist at the end of the plot, which is really quite nice. So I've got a couple of questions left for you. And this is great to kind of sip along. This is something that I've missed profoundly, just getting to sip with people, even though you're across the pond. But this, these are now available, both of these. What are they supposed to I know retail changes throughout the world and stuff, but roughly what do these run on the shelf? So that's not one that I know off the top of my head. Um, so I can definitely get back to you on that for the US prices at any rate. But here in the UK, it's about 35 to 37 pounds. So it won't be a, a huge amount more. In fact, I think because of duty and various other things, I think you guys get a really good deal on these. I think I recall. Yeah, I think you're dollars. Yeah, I think, I think they're, they're definitely not more than forty dollars for both of these. And the, the amount of craftsmanship and work and taste and flavor that goes into these—that's um, a really good price. <laughs> well, it makes me think you're not getting paid enough, James. But I'm the, we'll have to talk to John about that. But the fact that <laughs> well, if, if, if this is how I raise the uh, <laughs> the pay rise question, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the proof is in the work, right? 
Well, I, I, think got, so. I think so too. When well, I got one last question for you, and we're going to take it to kind of an author perspective here. So you can sip, we're going to do two authors, one for the artist blend and one for the Glasgow blend and Glasgow blend. And so you could be anywhere in the world sipping these two fine whiskeys with any writer, writer or deceased who might you like to have a dram with over artist blend secondly then with the glasgow blend and it could be the same person i don't know such a good question artist blend i feel like because of its because of its clarity and its concentration you know you've got a, a prose style which is you know really quite powerful now i'm tempted to say hemingway but i couldn't have kept up with him with with the drinks yeah so maybe maybe not him um but there is a, there is a scottish author who's based in um edinburgh i think that's where she grew up as well muriel spark incredible incredible writer. So she's best known for the pride of miss jean brody but there are other works by her the driver's seat uh, the mandelbaum gate so tightly wrapped so rich um and so incredibly i guess intricate mm -hmm. and i think um she would have enjoyed this as well no way of knowing if she was a whiskey drinker um that wasn't part of my dissertation <laughs> uh, but um that would be the one for artist blend and then glasgow it's between two so thackeray is my my favorite author and i just think he would have he knew his food he knew his wines mm -hmm. uh, he, he knew his spirits as well they come up a lot in vanity fair but my favorite scottish author um, both in terms of his madcap imagination, uh, but also his scholarly integrity. Uh, he passed away uh, a little over a year ago, Alistair Gray. Uh, so his best known work is Lanark, um, which has written many, many other books, lots of collections of short stories, incredible artist as well. Um, he would be someone I would love, love to have had a drink with. Um, there's a, a whiskey writer I'm sure you know of very well, Dave Broom. Mm. He did a film in 2019 called The Amber Light, uh, which is all about the culture of whiskey. And I'd recommend anyone watching this, uh, once you've tired of me prattling on, go <laughs> out into the internet and, and find that, because there is an interview uh, with Alistair Gray, a very brief one. I'm sure it was a much longer one before the edit. Um, but you just see the, the ramshackle shelves, the, the immaculate desk, um, just the concentration, the life devoted to language and art. Um, such an erudite man and such a great sense of humor. Um, and so Alistair Gray would have, uh, would have been the one. It's, it's incredible. And I'm, I'm learning it's the, I think sometimes. But what about reason, yours? Oof, well, it's a tough one. You're talking but like this. I think that when you get into the Glasgow blend, we're talking Bukowski for sure. <laughs> low down dirty male guy you know <laughs> but when it comes to kind of refined writing i don't know that i ever read a bunch of refined writing to be honest americans aren't necessarily known for that you know uh, ambrose pierce maybe but he's kind of whore i think there's some some interesting things there but i'm not gonna claim to have the the master of arts degree in english literature so i'm a i've got a stupid business degree james so we'll talk about business guys i guess you know but it's been a pleasure again to sip these with you and again i applaud all the work that you guys do at compass box and the team is lovely karen's great for setting this thing up and i can't wait for more people to get to try these and see all the intricacies and the label and the design which is just as important sometimes as the intricacy Absolutely. in the blending so i appreciate you taking the time out i will be in london at some point and we will have to share a dram in person. Yes, you are more than welcome at our blending room at uh, any time. And uh, we can show you what, what London has to offer. Much appreciated, James. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much, Mike. Sure, thank you. So there we have it, James Saxon of Compass Box Whiskey talking about the new Artist Blend and Glasgow Blend. You have light and you got dark. I don't know if you like Pete like me, but that's when you dive into the red label Glasgow Blend for a little more richness. And a little more dunceness. Just look at the label. It's pretty brilliant. James, lovely to chat with you all the way from London. Hopefully, I'll see you soon. And we'll sip some whiskeys, but hopefully, maybe we can blend some whiskeys together. The world is opening up, and I'm feeling good about it. I hope you are, too. So thanks, everybody, for listening to Show to V with Mike G. 
No matter what you're doing this evening, or if you're finally going to Dave and Buster's after all of this lockdown, please keep dancing.